Okay, well, hi everyone. Welcome to our latest as a live webinar. I'm glad everyone can make it. Um, it's really a pleasure for us to be able to bring so many people together to discuss key issues to all of us. So to the topic of today's webinar, it might feel out of place when discussing all of the challenges of dealing with what is an unprecedented economic and health crisis to be also talking about opportunities. But for the time that we're in for Africa really to avoid the risk scenarios that we're faced with of food insecurity, of lasting economic and social damage, it is really opportunities that have to be seized by individuals, businesses and governments if we're to get essential supplies moving again and people earning the money that they need to feed themselves and to survive. So a big part of this challenge and opportunity is about cross-border trade within Africa and also between Africa and the rest of the world. I'm Gavin Serkin, the founder and managing editor of New Markets Media and Intelligence. We work with researchers, media, governments and businesses to better understand frontier and emerging markets. Leading us through today's conversation is Thomas Birgen, who is Treasury Manager at AZA. And he is, of course, at home in Nairobi. And it sounded like earlier some very enthusiastic and engaged children with him. So we could hear some excited noises coming from there. Who knows? Um, we're going to kick off with some of the key insights from AZA's trading and research team. And we'll address some of the questions from what is a very significant group gathered on today's call. Please do post any further questions and share any thoughts, anecdotes, opinions that you might have as we go through the topics using the chat function on Zoom. And I'll do my best to address those. Um, while we can't interact physically, we at least want to connect as much as we can digitally. So please share your name and organization with your comments and questions, or alternatively, if you'd rather remain anonymous, that's also absolutely fine. Speaking of which, we are under Chatham House rules. So for any journalists on the call, please just get in touch with us. Let us know if there's anything you would like to cite or quote, and we'll be very happy to further uh, e either confirm or arrange a very quick follow up. One final note, your microphones should be muted, but if they're not, please do mute them. Uh, we're going to have some polls as we go along during today's conversation. So I'll come back to those a bit later. But let's first begin, um, Tom, if you wouldn't mind, talking us through some of the challenges that have been created by COVID, including um, speaking from your own direct experience, the challenges um, that we've, that's a lot of businesses are facing of foreign currency shortages, the measures being taken by various jurisdictions and the opportunities, what businesses and some governments have done to stay ahead uh, during, this, during this crisis. Tom, I'll hand over to you. Um, thank you so much, uh, Gavin, and uh, happy to have you all on the call today. Um, as, we continue, as we start discussing uh, this crucial topic of COVID, uh, the challenges and difficulties of, of inter Africa and uh, cross-border trade. Um, I'll take you um, or the, at a glance, this is on international level. Um, the current number of uh, COVID cases is over 3 million. And um, in Africa, uh, we have confirmed over 27,000 cases. Uh, if you can check the percentages, there is less than 1%. Uh, of the total uh, global figure. Uh, so despite uh, this figure being less than 1%, uh, it is estimated uh, that, uh, it is estimated uh, that uh, the, 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 the GDP of the continent is going to, uh, the growth is going to halve. Um, it has been projected that 2020, uh, growth of uh, GDP will be close to 3.2%. Uh, but with this COVID now, um, it's a matter of approximately 1.5 now. So um, checking on Africa, um, Africa is a big continent uh, with 52 member states. Uh, and this is a population of 1.2 billion people. Uh, and uh, it's a control of uh, 
2.5 trillion when it comes to GDP. So of this 2.3 million GDP, 43% um, of the income that is generated in Africa, 43% comes from cross-border payments. Uh, this is cross-border trades, uh, which includes payment, uh, exchange of goods and services, uh, among others. The other percentage is basically agriculture, tourism, manufacturing, mining, just to mention a few. So checking about uh, cross-border trades in Africa, um, we can see that Africa trades mostly with international markets. Uh, a statistic survey, 80% uh, of people, of Africans or Africa markets trans, uh, transacting with international markets. Uh, that leaves us with only 20% with only of uh, the amount that we transact uh, within ourselves. Um, Africa in nature is a commodity-based um, economy. It's a commodity-based economy, uh, meaning we, we, we export commodities, uh, especially minerals, cocoa, coffee, tea, rubber, among other things. And uh, statistically, what we export is mainly raw materials, what we can call them um, unprocessed or unfinished goods. So uh, I'll be happy to deep dive and uh, access the impact of uh, COVID-19 so far in relation to Africa businesses and um, trades. Yeah, so um, Africa is hardly hit because, um, is hardly hit because uh, the, as from the, from the discussion I've told you, um, most, uh, majorly our business is commodity-based. Uh, and in a commodity-based setting, um, then you'll see a lot of, of exportation that will take place. And uh, now with the closure of borders, there's a lockdown. What we see are job losses because you can no longer export. So if your business was in exportation of commodities, you can no longer do that. Um, and in the end, losing a major source of income will eventually uh, lead to increase in poverty levels. Um, Africa, businesses are not that big in nature, a big percentage, 43% uh, are mostly um, what they can call informal trades. And in, in a case of our informal settings, um, then the, the, the volume of transactions is quite so small. Now with the closure of the borders and uh, with government giving directions of lockdown, less human movements. So what we expect to see is uh, businesses being sent out of uh, operations. And in the end, there's a lot of uh, losses in terms of jobs, in terms of um, opportunities. And yeah, Africa is hardly hit uh, on these scenarios. Checking also on um, food security, we majorly depend on agricultural products. And uh, most African countries are situated in the de desert, uh, maybe the upper part of uh, Africa. And um, they depend to get food from other neighboring countries. And now with, when you talk about lockdowns, when you talk about no access of cargo services or no entrance of vehicles, what you expect to see is food insecurity looming in. Um, even recently, um, we can, you, you have heard from the media about um, the, trial or the, the pandemic. Before, before COVID, we had uh, locust invasion. And uh, the hardly eat department or the hardly eat sector is the food sector, uh, agricultural sector. And uh, what we see with the general lockdown, no movement of people, um, we expect to see a lot of problems when it comes to food. Uh, over dependence of China to get uh, industrial materials um, for construction um, as, 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 as real, has already resulted to increase in prices of construction materials. We can see a 15% increment of um, prices. And in the end, 
we, ex we, we may see uh, a total lockdown when it comes to, to construction industry. Um, also, we are seeing a situation whereby poverty levels are increasing and um, And uh, with increase in poverty levels with, um, within the economy, what do you expect to see uh, cases of insecurity? What happens now when um, you close the border and your neighbor doesn't have anything to eat? Or generally poverty begets or poverty brings uh, the issue of insecurity. Uh, African countries mostly do um, in exportation and uh, tourism. And um, we, we have invested a lot when it comes to tourism industry, airlines and transportation. This lockdown has brought a lot of problems when it comes to debt and physical deficits. We can no longer sustain ourselves. We have, been, we have loans to pay, we have bills to pay. And um, with the total lockdown, uh, mostly the hardly hit is the tourism industry then what we expect to see is debt and uh, most jurisdictions, the poor countries that are, uh, a good example is Kenya and Ghana um, in Tanzania that de uh, majorly depend on tourism to visit their costs. Um, the, the big chunks of international debt that we have mostly to China will result generally to uh, physical deficits. We cannot, we cannot sustain them anymore. And uh, whenever you can't sustain yourself, uh, you, you're definitely going to get what you call foreign exchange shortages. Um, from where I sit, um, cross-border payments has been hardly hit because of uh, lack of foreign exchange. Um, hard currencies is in high demand at the moment. Uh, the biggest country being Nigeria and Angola, the exporters of oil. Exporters of oil, yes, and um, they um, with the with the global prices of oil stamp, uh, going down, um, they hardly eat people. Are uh, the people who now are dependent on uh, or jurisdictions or businesses who depend now on oil service or oil to to get their foreign exchanges? And um, these are biggest issue. Uh, that I'm going to discuss in my next slide here. Uh, Nigerian Naira, as, as we speak uh, from the beginning of uh, the year, was at 360, uh, both uh, that is, I'm talking about the parallel market. Um, but now when the COVID situation came in and the international global market uh, set in, uh, oil prices depreciated, and what resulted was Naira prices depreciating all the way, um, it went down by 5%. Then as we speak, it's at 450, which is 25, close to 20% uh, depreciation. So um, shortages of FX means a lot to businesses, most of the ones that, uh, that are doing cross-border payments, uh, businesses that depend on uh, FX to settle their supplies. Um, you can no longer pay your supplies when you don't have uh, the hard currencies. And um, whenever you don't have the hard currencies, there's, there's little importation you can do. And in the end, what will happen to your economy is inflation will set in. The little that is available in our shops, the little that is available in our various businesses in terms of uh, commodities, the price is going to escalate. Yeah, this is a situation whereby uh, prices are so high. Uh, there's a lot of demand for goods, but the supply has been cut uh, as a result of locked um, uh, an availability of, ex of of importation. So um, these are really big issue also to uh, jurisdictions like uh, South Africa, where even bef before the COVID, they had e economic uh, issues. Um, the, the, the run started depreciating way in, 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 in January. Uh, and as we speak, it's close to 10% uh, down. And um, this has resulted to many people um, 
lose closing their shops, closing their businesses because uh, things are not so you can you can longer sustain. They hardly hit past, uh, they hardly hit uh, the consumers of uh, commodities within these jurisdictions. They can no longer manage with their little income, with their little businesses. Then that's a big issue to to buy goods and services at uh, very uh, at a skyrocketed prices. So yeah, Africa. Uh, even if we are hardly hit, uh, we are we are seeing a situation whereby we can overcome. We can stay ahead of uh, the curve. Uh, businesses together with the government, there is a way. We have opportunities, and uh, we'd like to see how what these uh, opportunities are or what uh, the businesses and governments are doing in order to stay out of the curve. Um, so businesses uh, hardly hit with the general closure of, of airports, the uh, minimum interaction between humans and uh, minimum uh, interaction between a minimum cross-border payments, I mean, minimum cross-border trades. Uh, what businesses are doing at the moment is uh, coming up and uh, partner in order to leverage using the existing infrastructure. Um, a good example we have is what we see um, within companies. I can give an example of Kenya. Uh, there's a company called Trigger Foods together with Zumia. They partnered uh, to bring agricultural products to people's doorsteps. Uh, this is a situation whereby, yes, consumers can no longer come to your shop. Um, you can no longer transport uh, things the way you used to transport cargo, say, uh, to your consumers. Now, um, why don't you utilize the, the available infrastructure that we have in place? Uh, Zoomia have the platform for customers and um, Twigger have the product. So what they're doing is they partner. You can borrow, uh, you, can, you can go to the to online via Zoomia and um, get to order goods and serve, uh, goods. And um, in the end, um, Twigger will deliver them to your doorstep. So that's uh, what we talk about, the partnership uh, that are existing. You're, lever you're leveraging through the infrastructure that we have in order to ensure that uh, you continue surviving in this, uh, continue with your business and survive in these hard times. Um, also, we're talking about tech and innovation. Um, this is a very good opportunity and um, I can say the biggest winners are the tech companies. Um, they're using, this is the time that they're shining. Uh, businesses are doing what you call tech innovations. Um, we have, uh, as I mentioned in my first point about uh, delivery of goods and services via the app. Now we have other avenues where applications and phone technology is needed. Uh, for example, homeschooling. Children are at home or students are at, are at home at the moment. And um, they need to go on with their uh, education as normal. So innovations around homeschooling are really making a lot of money. I can give you an example of a company called Zerika. It's a Kenyan based and um, it is offering um, homeschooling for high school students in, in Kenya and a lot of schools have already signed up to them. So that means an income to them amid this crisis. Um, can I talk about companies that are cutting costs um, initially, there are costs that you, you incur as a business in the normal operations. Um, employees at the moment, most of them are working at home. What are the things that, can, what are the things that, that you can save when your employees are at, are at home? Can you save on the internet cost? Yes. Uh, can you save on rent? Yes, you can close the office and um, allow your employees to work at home. And what you need is basically uh, ensuring that the little money you save you will, will, will keep you going in these hard times. Instead of uh, laying off your workers, what you need to, to see is a situation whereby your, your, your workers are still working and um, the business is, is going on as well. 
uh, there's an opportunity uh, that has shown itself in this tough time, uh, the issue of streamlining our border systems. For a very long time, we have had uh, porous borders, borders with a lot of um, insecurity, um, movements between people and vehicles within borders without any truck. This is the hard time. This is the best time that you need to know who are the people who are using your borders. Are they proper systems that you need to put in place so that whenever uh, there's any kind of movement, um, it is tracked? Um, most borders experience uh, losses in terms of uh, taxes because goods are being smuggled. A good example is Kenya and Somali border. Uh, recently, Kenya um, banned uh, a, a, a a huge cargo of dried fish from, from Somalia. What happened is uh, the consignment find itself to Kenya, but it passed through the borders, meaning our borders and don't have good systems. Uh, we may be bringing bad things or smuggled goods. And uh, in the end, we are, lacking, we, we are missing on something. We are, we are lacking the, the tax that we, we should be getting to, uh, to our coffers or to our revenue. Uh, another opportunity that has presented itself is on the issue of cementing diplomatic ties. It's high time now um, when you need each other in terms of uh, ensuring that your borders are, sec are secure. Uh, working together as, a, as Africa has always been an issue because we, we sometimes lack diplomatic ties. Uh, a good example is what is happening uh, Chad, Niger, and Nigeria. Uh, a lot of insecurities in their borders and um, the, the various high commissions and governments are not working together well. What they need is a situation whereby they're cementing their diplomatic ties. They're making uh, things work around them, um, work around their, their, their neighbors and uh, staying, staying in peace. Um, yes, uh, apart from the opportunities that have presented itself, there is more that we need as Africa businesses uh, to do in order to stay afloat in our businesses. Um, we need to invest heavily in human capital. This is basically uh, the people that you work with uh, will, will ensure that they propel you during these tough times. Are they able to work remotely? Are they able to, to give you solutions? Are they able to be strong enough during these tough times? Yeah. Uh, another issue is with the trade blocks that we have, or I can call them regional economic uh, corporations or communities. Um, you need to put in place the uh, measures during these tough times. Yes, you can allow your peop uh, people to move in and out across your borders. You're, doing, you're putting on measures to ensure that there's safety uh, and there is no spread of the COVID-19. Uh, what do you do to the payments that they're supposed to pay on as they cross the border, can you defer them temporarily until this is sorted? Yeah. Uh, I'll also talk about um, Africa businesses exploring uh, other avenues of getting money apart from what we see at the moment. Uh, most Africa countries are debt ridden because they are using debt for, to finance most of the infrastructure. Uh, what else can they do apart from using debt? They have other things they can do. They can uh, outsource uh, capital locally. Yeah, maybe float some treasury or government bonds. And uh, with that, you, you, you will ease your fiscal deficit. You will ensure that you don't have a lot of um, debt to pay and uh, maybe straining your currency, straining your economy. Um, this is an opportunity also for Africa countries to invest heavily in their digital economy. Um, as I'd spoken before about the winners being the tech companies, yes, there are so many things we, we can do uh, as Africa to win in, in the digital economy. It's a big economy uh, and it's winning. Um, I know everybody knows that at the moment we are all staying at home and uh, working remotely. What we are using are basically digital tools. If our digital economy is stronger, then our, our regions uh, will be stronger, our jurisdictions will be stronger and businesses as well, and will stay afloat during this tough time. Um, our, our, our trade trades at our borders 
are facing a lot of challenges because we, we have not streamlined. Uh, we don't have any measure to streamline trades within our borders. And um, what are the measures that we can, we can put in place is, uh, is a good question that we need to ask ourselves. We need to facilitate cross-border payments. We need to facilitate cross-border trades, yeah, and ensuring that we, we stay afloat during this tough time. There are several uh, regional economic uh, communities uh, in Africa. The biggest ones being Comesa, that is the common market of East Africa and Central East and Central Africa. We have SADAC, that is a South African one, and uh, we have the East Africa community that is um, for East Africans. And we have many other regional coordinations, uh, regional bodies, and um, the one that is enacted so recently is the uh, Africa Continental Free Trade Area. Um, during this time, it really, we really need a, a very strong um, body that can ensure that we, 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 we continue to increase our trades uh, amid um, tension, amid a crisis of this kind. What we need to see is um, a situation whereby your cargo, is not, your cargo is not returned at the port because you don't belong to a certain economic block, right? Um, I can also explain about industrialization. Um, we, uh, we, we, we import heavily because we have not invested in our own industries. We tend to, uh, can give an example of Kenya, we killed our textile industry because we have been doing uh, importation of secondhand clothes, mostly from China and other countries abroad. Uh, now with the closure of, biz of, of borders, uh, we, we cannot continue like this. We cannot live without this product that we've always been importing. What else can we do? We have uh, an opportunity to promote the little uh, industries that we have. Uh, instead of going to buy secondhand clothes, uh, promote your textile industry. That is the situation you're seeing in Kenya, uh, that mass can be, can be made in Kenya. Yeah, and other jurisdictions like Nigeria, yes, they are creating things uh, on their own. Great. Okay, thank you so much, Tom. So uh, before we'll, we'll go into Q&A in just a moment because we've got a lot of really uh, very probing questions from the participants. Um, so we've got, we got lots of time for that. Um, I just want to put a couple of questions though first to our participants, which are two polling questions. Um, the first is, has your business been directly or indirectly affected by border lockdowns? And the answers are either yes, directly affected by border lockdowns, yes, indirectly affected by lockdowns, or no, not affected. And I'll just leave people a minute to answer that while I turn to Tom uh, again for our first question from the participants. And uh, this is from Sarah Serban, um, who asks, other than the loss of business for the informal economies of Africa during COVID-19, what other effects do you foresee and what measures can informal economies take to survive? Uh, apart from the loss of businesses, we are seeing uh, informal economies um, losing heavily in terms of uh, food insecurity. Um, I can describe informal economies in Africa as um, small in nature. Uh, mostly when you talk about informal businesses, uh, they're small in nature. Um, they require little capital to remain afloat. And um, apart from these people who operate these small businesses, apart from them losing their businesses, then there's an issue of food security. They depend on on that uh, little income to fend for their family. 
And uh, whenever they can't operate, then what we, we expect is increase in poverty. Um, these are the um, people uh, or businesses who don't have access to credit. And uh, generally, uh, may, uh, they, they, we, we see a situation whereby they're gonna go into debts. Um, these are the people also, or the informal uh, businesses that don't have access to insurance for either for their products or even medical insurance. And what may be looming is a health problem. Uh, and the measure that we can take uh, in, the, in the short run is to have what we call financial inclusion, uh, allow them to get uh, credit uh, at better terms, yeah, to allow uh, expansion pre uh, post COVID. Um, another point is uh, them getting insurance uh, so that they can cushion themselves against extreme disasters, uh, and manage, uh, help them manage to get uh, or to survive during this hard time. Uh, a good example I can give is recently uh, an insurance company in Kenya that was uh, offering to, to cushion uh, their members and even new members and even allowing them to to get a cover and get signed uh, without even meeting face to face right okay um thanks for the polling answers um i've got one more poll for everyone which is this question what do you think is the most important step that african businesses need to take to survive the economic impact of COVID-19? Is it A, product diversification? Is it B, expansion to other countries in the region? Is it C, digitization? Or D, should African businesses be doing something else? Is, it, is the most important thing for them to do something else? So again, what do you think is the most important step that African businesses need to take to survive the economic impact of COVID. Um, Tom, let me turn to the second question for you, which is from Vincent Nwanma from Business Day in Nigeria. How could Africa have avoided over-reliance on foreign trade? What models now best suit Africa's position given what COVID-19 has revealed about the continent? Yes. Um... African African countries and uh, businesses have always held um, colonial links, um, and that's really explain why they are relying on foreign trades. Um, checking on statistics, um, I can say uh, Kenya, for example, are trading so much with UK, trading so much with other jurisdictions. Uh, maybe maybe basically because. Um, England was former colonial master. Same thing to Senegal, for example. Uh, they are trading so much uh, with, um, with, with France um, compared to the neighbors. So what we need, uh, the best models we can do is having stronger internal systems. Um, have, us have a way, first of all, of consuming whatever you have internally. And um, a good example I can give here is um, local tourism. In Kenya, we, we tend to see um, international tourism coming in huge numbers compared to uh, our local tourism. And what we see happening uh, or put in place is uh, uh, a program like uh, Tembea Kenya, that means um, travel more within your country. It's a, it's a, it's a model that allows uh, the booming of the tourism industry without the de dependence of foreign foreigners. And th this is something that we, we are seeing uh, bearing fruits. Uh, I can also talk about um, having a competitive intra-Africa linking um, infrastructure. Instead of having um, a bigger airports, uh, bigger ports linking uh, the country and the international or foreign countries, why don't you have um, infrastructure that links uh, yourself and uh, your neighbor? Yeah, I can talk about uh, our situation in East Africa. We are we are making uh, we are working on a on a on Trans Africa highway that is supposed to connect Kenya, Uganda, Rwanda, 
that's something that is intra-Africa. It's linking, it's, it's a competitive thing because it's connecting Africa countries. And uh, we, we, we see that it's going to be uh, a good thing post-COVID. I can also talk about having strong uh, economic regional communities um, that allows you to operate freely within, uh, within uh, intra-Africa without much of a dependence of the foreign trade. Okay, uh, Tom, what measures are being taken to mitigate the, the effect of the pandemic on trade without spreading the virus further? That's a question from Gaga Andrew, for, who is with VT Bora in Uganda. And he also asks, what is the way forward for trade in Africa? Um, for the continuation of trade in Africa, we need uh, more access to grants. We need more access to credits. Uh, Africa businesses, we always cash um, driven. We need a lot of uh, money to continue. And um, with the current situation, we need uh, to see uh, governments. We need to see donors. Uh, we need to see even banks coming in handy uh, to, assist us, uh, to assist our businesses during this pandemic. Uh, recently, we read about the Afri Exim Bank, that is the Africa uh, Export and Import Bank that announced that is it's giving um, three billion dollars US dollars to fund uh, economies within Africa. This is something that you can see um, it will it will cushion us and it will propel uh, businesses uh, within Africa. Uh, currently, when we have this, this pandemic and. Uh, Uh, Tom, are you still with us? Uh, I think we may have a connection issue with Tom. Let's just give it a minute. Yes, if, sorry. Yeah, sorry. go ahead. Back, um, some power outage. Okay. Yes. One of the challenges. Exactly. So uh, also talking about the cutting costs, um, as I've spoken before, uh, Africa businesses, um, now that we have limited access to, to our various offices, to our various uh, destinations of entertainment. How about that us uh, cutting costs on traveling, rent, uh, entertainment among others, uh, to remain afloat during this time and uh, going forward. Uh, also talk about, I can talk about um, African businesses increasing their lines of uh, revenue. Uh, by diversifying here, I mean, you can do one thing as a business and uh, you can also think about something else uh, to do, which may not be your major line of business. Uh, what we're seeing with Ethiopian Airlines, for example, um, they, they've been doing uh, passenger flights and now uh, with, uh, with the passenger flights uh, not being lucrative or the lockdown, then what we're seeing the situation whereby they, they are now doing cargo transportation. It's taking advantage uh, of diversification to increase um, more line of business or revenue. Okay, there's, there's kind of a related question that I've got next, which is from Chiponda Chimbelu from Deutsche Welle. Uh, what, what are the examples, if any, um, in which African countries are leveraging this as opportunity to promote intra-Africa trade? And with supply chains disrupted, are there any areas in which new ones within Africa could be established? Yes, true. As I mentioned before, uh, we have the drone uh, uh, delivery, um, the drone-based delivery done by Zipline. Uh, it's an international company, but uh, they have done tests uh, within Rwanda. They have done tests in Ghana. And what they are doing is delivery of, um, they started by doing delivery of blood to affected uh, communities. And now they're even doing a uh, delivery of drugs and um, personal protect protective equipments. Yes, and this can be used uh, to leverage um, transportation or supply chain uh, even during these tough times. Okay, a question from Endurance Aku who asks, what, to what extent does the current disruption affect investment and particularly private equity investment, but also other investments in African companies. 
and endurance is from Stanbig Kai BTC pension managers in Nigeria. Um, generally, when it comes to investments uh, across Africa, we expect to see a significant drop. Um, looking back to the 2008-2009 uh, recession, uh, there was an eight, eight, around 20% decrease in uh, the aggregate investments. Uh, that is majorly in the UK and uh, Europe. Uh, I can relate this to Africa situations whereby at the moment we have a lot of uh, VCs, we have a lot of private equity, uh, we have a lot of startups that require funding. Uh, with the same uh, statistics or with the same projections, we see a general decrease uh, in deals that are going to be closed. Um, in terms of private equity, uh, I can mention that uh, Africa startups are going to lose mostly in terms of funding. Um, last year was a big win for Africa. Um, most deals were closed within Africa in terms of uh, startup funding and in the general uh, investment. So we expect to see uh, a decline in that. Um, talking about other investment uh, sectors, say real estate, um, we expect to see some kind of stalling. Uh, you can check about uh, assuming this situation continues because uh, uh, statistically they are projecting that in Africa uh, we're going to re uh, re regain normalcy within a period of six to eight months. Then you can see we, we may not need offices. So what will happen to real estate? Um, People are doing online shopping. They are, not, they are no longer going to the malls. So that part is, is at the heat as well. Okay. Now we, we've got quite a few more questions um, that have come in during the webinar. I'm going to go through those and, and some of them will be um, on areas that we've touched on before. Um, after that, just before the, we, we finish in about 10 minutes, we will have the results of the polls as well. So um, Tom, question from Ebenezer or Les Sessi, um, who asked, what do you think is the best approach for Africa to restoring her economy? Also, most African nations might slide into recession or possibly depression. What's the best way forward, considering that international debt raising could be difficult due to junk credit ratings? Yes. Um, in the long run, um, we expect to see uh, African countries uh, taking opportunities of available uh, resources. Um, we expect to see more funding from donors, first of all. Um, but generally, um, African jurisdictions should like talk to their debtors and uh, get to, to, to see how they can renegotiate the various um, debts they have with the with the don with the debtors and. Um, as I said before, uh, trying to find a way of uh, financing it, uh, themselves or financing the businesses within uh, without getting debts, uh, without borrowing. Okay. Another question is to, if you can outline a few solid areas where business owners can build to sustain growth. Um, I can mention the issue, the, uh, the, the, the topic of um, digital platform or digital presence. Um, businesses can, can take advantage of um, technology. As you can see in this situation of COVID, the biggest winners are the, the ones doing business uh, online. This is something that we can, they can take advantage of and are built on it. Um, what can you do uh, as a business to uh, to ensure that whatever services you're, you're, you're providing is available online, is available um, on a digital platform and uh, get access to a wider um, clientele. Okay. Um, Nicholas, uh, Zati asks, um, there are problems with Africans trading with each other. For example, the East African community um, there are still many tariffs and non-tariffs being imposed arbitrarily. What do you think is the way forward? Um, having strong um, inter 
inter intra Africa communities, or can I can call them uh, regional economic blocks, is what is needed in these situations. Um, in most cases, a very good a good situation is a symbiotic kind of relationship. If you have a pro, if uh, trading with your neighbor should become some kind of symbiotic, you are all gaining from one another. So uh, having a stronger um, rec, what you can call a regional economic uh, cooperation between countries, uh, it will give you like an avenue to renegotiate about your tariffs, taxes that you're charging to on cross border uh, trades. Kenneth Mugasa asks, um, what steps should African governments take to improve the value addition of their products with regard to African exports? How can they make the exports more valuable from maybe the standard products that, are, that get exported? Uh, industrialization, um, as I'd spoken before about uh, Africa countries exporting um, their products in, the, uh, in, I can call them raw products, what we need is proper systems or proper uh, in, uh, industrialization. Instead of, transport, of exporting milk, why don't you first of all um, process them to cheese maybe to yogurt then export by doing that you have, you, have, you have added the value, right? So yeah, government together with businesses should come together and ensure that they, ha they, they um, capitalize on this infrastructure within their countries that will enable them to process commodities, process goods and uh, export them as finished products and not as raw materials. Okay, the next question touches on the tourist industry, which you were discussing before. It's a question from Enoch Kandahura, who asks, um, within our own countries, it's often more expensive to go sightseeing and getting to tourist places. And yet, some of our colleagues would prefer to go to foreign tours. Um, how do you address that issue? Uh, that is the issue of um, making strong uh, internal systems. Um, try to, to get pride of what you're doing. I gave an example of uh, what we have in Kenya, a program called Tembea Kenya. Um, it, it's, a, it's a way of um, uh, ensuring that the locals get to enjoy more. Um, and uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's a good scenario whereby now uh, the foreign tourism are not coming. It's an opportunity for the local ones to, to take that position and uh, ensure that that business continues. So what governments need to do uh, is to maybe lower costs uh, for the locals. By doing this, we'll encourage them to travel within their local uh, tourist destinations instead of going to, instead, uh, in preference to foreign destinations. Okay, question from Basi Udo from Premium Times in Nigeria. How can the challenges of currency and language difference barriers be handled? Um, the issue of currency, um, not so, I'm not sure um, I wanted to know about um, the, the challenge, how, how can governments address or authorities address the challenges of currency and language differences uh, in trading? You know, what are the solutions to differences in currencies and trade and, and language? Um, when it comes to currency, um, uh, to ensure, first of all, your currency stay afloat um, and avoid uh, the depreciation thing. Um, Governments need to put in place measures that uh, can bring some kind of trade balance. Um, whenever you have more exports and than, than, than imports, that make your currency stronger. But now a situation whereby you're importing more, uh, your currency is gonna, uh, we, will be weaker. So the government should put measures in place to ensure that uh, their trade balance stays afloat um, they are striking a balance between their export and imports. And um, language barrier, it's something that uh, we need to embrace um, 
it, it's it's more of a culture. Uh, we need to em- to embrace each other's culture and uh, cross border trade should not be hindered by language barrier. Um, jurisdictions should invest in learning foreign languages. Uh, they should invest in getting to know cultures of other people. And this involves tr- um, interactions through various uh, platforms, interaction through traveling. And uh, with this, I'm sure uh, jurisdictions will uh, foster um, good cohesion. Mm-hmm. The, the next question is, I, I guess, in response to um, countries going to the IMF and other institutions for loans, is it not the right time for African countries to start utilizing resources from within rather than relying on donors or loans from outside? And that's from Leonard Ringia. Great, great point. Yes. Um, Businesses and uh, jurisdictions in general need to find a way of uh, getting funds within. Um, as I give an example of uh, floating their bonds and getting funds within themselves, by doing this, um, what you'll be lowering is um, lowering the debt burden. Um, another point that I can put across there is a situation whereby we're seeing uh, Local or Africa jurisdictions, yes, getting funding from foreigners, uh, but having them in local currencies. This is something that can help cushion your local currencies against uh, any fluctuations in the international market. So, for example, at the moment, uh, loans got from um, foreign, foreign, foreign jurisdictions, say in euros. Um, Euros hardly hit as well we, um, during this uh, pandemic period, and yes, having having um, infrastructure that can help uh, raise capital within will uh, make uh, will will come in handy to ensure that uh, you you remain um, debtless. I mean, without uh, less debt uh, hit. Okay, and th- these are some very important questions that we're getting um, towards the end. Uh, from, one from Chijoke Odo, who says the start of trade using the African Continental Free Trade Agreement is 1st of July. Um, it looks like the start date will be pushed back as a result of COVID in light of the disruptions to international trade and supply chains. Can Africa afford to delay operationalization? Op- the operation of this agreement? Um, in my opinion, um, there's little that uh, can be done to, to hasten this uh, enactment of the F- uh, Africa continental free trade uh, area deal. And uh, yes, it is the opportunity time that we wanted this and um, we are hardly hit already. Uh, our borders are closed and um, we are having troubles uh, find striking a balance between uh, prevention of the COVID uh, through our porous borders and also uh, allowing the continuation of uh, transactions in uh, trades between our borders. Um, we, we really need this, but yes, sometimes um, um, our jurisdictions have some kind of bureaucracy when it comes to um, enactment or uh, I can call it um, operation. We tend to take time, uh, we tend to weigh situations and um, what we really need is having this signed and uh, enacted uh, as, uh, as soon as possible and any, any further delay may result to to adverse effects on our cross-border trades. In my opinion, we may have little to do with this, um, but yes, uh, in, as, as Africa jurisdictions, we really need this to be enacted as soon as possible. Okay, you mentioned Afri- uh, agriculture earlier and some of the dislocation in that, in, in that crucial industry. Um, Buhara Shakira asks, what is the future of agricultural products and farming in Africa? 
um, with the enactment of um, more regional uh, economic cooperation or communities in Africa, we, we, we see a situation whereby um, Africans are going to consume uh, products within themselves. And um, we are seeing most African countries going mecha um, mechanizing, I can call it automating, uh, not mechanizing the agricultural uh, processes. And uh, I can give a good example of um, a company called Hello Tractor that are doing great in terms of ensuring that uh, um, communities that lack infrastructure to cultivate uh, are getting them. So most of, um, when we get more of these, then we, we, we are sure that um, as Africa, I think we've temporarily lost Tom, but I'm sure he'll be coming back in just a minute. Um, why don't I use this pause just to get the results of the poll? Um, so we had two questions. Uh, if we can get those poll results up um, and we'll come to those. Um, so the first question was, has your business been directly or indirectly affected by border closures? And 30% you said yes, directly. 48% said yes, indirectly. So we have a vast majority um, whose businesses have been either directly or indirectly affected by border closures. And then the second poll um, that we had um, if we uh, allow for that one to come up. Um, and maybe we'll do that in just a second. Is Tom back with us? Yes, I'm back with you. Sorry. Okay, Sorry. Tom, yeah. That's okay. Do you want to finish what your thought was on agriculture? Yes, um, I was talking about agriculture and being open, uh, in my opinion, that um, much can be done with mechanization. Uh, and I was giving an example of a company called Hello Tractor that was that is doing so much, uh, using available uh, digital platforms to ensure that uh, farmers get uh, mechanization and um, it, uh, scaling their production. So African agricultural sector is mostly small scale, and what we need to see is a large scale. And uh, large scale operation of agriculture requires uh, mechanization, which I am. Um, um, Certain most Africa countries are embracing it. Fantastic. So the second poll that we had was, what do you think is the most important step African businesses need to take to survive the economic impact of COVID-19? And 43% said it's product diversification, 35% said digitization, and 13% said expansion to other countries. Well, look, I, I want to thank Tom Bergen very much. Uh, he's Treasury Manager at ASA and the full team behind the analysis today. We did have more questions that we weren't able to get to, but we will post those, post some of the discussion topics on our Twitter, which is at ASA underscore Africa. Uh, where we'll also have um, more discussion and uh, some of the poll results um, in a bit more depth. Uh, we've discussed many issues when it comes to cross-border business during the webinar. ASA is dedicated to supplying liquidity and treasury solutions for growing businesses across Africa through the BFX product to send business payments cheaper, faster, and more easily visit tradebfx.com. Just a reminder for any journalists who are on the call, please get in touch with us to let us know anything that you would like to cite or quote uh, from this webinar and be more than happy to either confirm or to arrange a very quick follow-up. So thank you everyone, stay safe in your homes and we're wishing you all the very best during these tough times. Thank you.